Uh, I am Mrs. Pivnicheru, and today I have the great honor to introduce our guest speaker. Seven years ago, our English department started having one special English for You class every spring. In that, we have facilitated a meeting between students and one of the writers of the literary works they were studying in class. Today, our focus will be on identity, race, third space, and native Canadians. Our guest speaker today is Canadian playwright, novelist, journalist, and storyteller, Drew Hayden Taylor. Uh, some of the writings that Drew um, has done are, um, and I'm just going to list a few, Alternatives, God in the Indian, Cerulean Blue, Funny You Don't Look Like One, it's a series, The Night Wanderer, the novel, which is a vampire uh, native novel. He will be talking to you about it. He has written magazine articles for Maclean's Magazine, The Globe and Mail, Literary Review Canada, and he has been writer in residence for the University of Michigan, University of Western Ontario, University of Lunenburg in Germany, and Ryerson University. Today it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Drew Hayden Taylor. Good morning, everyone. In my language, uh, the Anishinaabe, we say hello by saying anin. Anin. Um, I guess I'll start off by giving you a little background, more background on who I am, where I come from, and I guess what I do. You heard I'm a writer. I am also um, I'm a First Nations writer, and when I uh, come in, and talk in places like this or in classes around the world, people always find it very interesting because they have this already this pre preconceived idea of what Canada's Indigenous people or First Nations people look like and the simple fact that I don't fit that image. And uh, so I always tell people, start off by telling them my favorite joke about my origins. Um, I grew up on a First Nations community called Curve Lake, which is about three hours northeast of here. And it's an, uh, an Ojibwe community, also known as Anishinaabe. So my standard joke is I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian, so technically that makes me an occasion. <laughs> mm. Would you believe a special occasion or at least a memorable occasion? <clears throat> Anyways, um, yes, I was, uh, I'm from a place called Curve Lake. It's a native community. And uh, I was born and raised there. And I'm one of, one of those rare breeds of animals you'll come across occasionally called a professional writer. That is what I do. I write all that I've written for about 30 years. Uh, I haven't had a real job since 1997, which I'm prou very proud of. Um, but as a writer, I'm, ve I'm very fortunate in the fact that I work in a number of different genres. I'm a playwright, a novelist, a short story writer. I write creative nonfiction, television. I've written a musical, a graphic novel, all these different things because I like to think of myself as a contemporary storyteller. And I've always been that way. Um, I have this very distinct memory of when I was five years old, sitting on the steps of my house on, and on the reserve, and on my lap I had a stack of comic books about yo thick. And I remember thinking, I was, as I said, I was five years old, looking at these comic books thinking, wow, next year I get to go to school and I'll actually be able to read these. And uh, the decades went by and I actually did learn how to read them and got to enjoy them and I got to learn to read and to enjoy reading and literature. And I, I wanted to read, uh, um, the more I read, the more I wanted to be a writer. And the reason was, um, when you're a writer, I was explaining this to the writer's craft earlier, one of the great things about being a writer is it gives you a certain amount of control. Um, in a, in a non-sacrilegious manner, it's like playing God. You get to create people, places, and things, universes. You can make people fight. You can make people fall in love. You can create problems, solutions, all these different things. It gives you more control over, over the reality, the universe you create, than, than you have over your own life, or at least that's what I discovered. So the more I read, the more I wanted to write. More interestingly, 
being a little, what I refer to as a half-breed kid growing up on a reserve out in the middle of nowhere, I would read these stories from places all over the world. And I found that so interesting. All these, all these stories from all over the world somehow made their way to the lap of this little kid on a reserve in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if someday I could tell stories about my community and ship them all over the world? And I did. So I, I was so shocked to find out I could do that, and I did it, and I'm still doing it. Um, but the problem with being a writer is I didn't know anything about it. And I was, when I was growing up, there weren't a lot of native writers. Um, and I, I had learned, I, it's hard, really hard to get into this, but I grew up across from my grandparents. And in front of my grandparents, there was this big fire pit, a bunch of trees and chairs. And from about late May to early October, I had a bunch of aunts, uncles, and cousins that would come over, sit around the fire, and tell funny stories. I grew up listening to funny stories. And I would listen to them, listen, and when it was time for me to go to bed, I would go home, go to sleep, or uh, go into my room, and we didn't have air conditioning, we just had mosquito screens. And I would listen, I could still hear people telling funny stories around that fire and laughing, and I'd go to sleep to that. And that became my lullaby. And as I grew up, I thought, wouldn't it be great to tell some of these funny stories and share them with the world? Now, in order, uh, in order to understand this, you have to understand the family I came from. At the same time, I came from both a big and a small family. I came from a big family because my mother was the oldest of 14. And that's what used to happen before you had the internet. <laughs> and with uh, marriages and stuff like that, I had about 20, 22 aunts and uncles and stuff like that. And I lost track of how many first cousins I had. I had somewhere around 22, 23, I lost track. Um, but on the other hand, I come from a very small family because I'm, the single, I'm a single child of a single parent. My mother, as you heard me say, was native, but my father was white and he took off before I was born, so I was basically raised by my mother. And I'm an only child because, as my mother says, I was, when I was born, I was 11 pounds, 13 ounces. Breach. No cesarean. So I grew up with this big family and this small family. And as one of the results of this was I got a lot of time to read by myself and I would read and I decided I wanted to be a writer. But the problem being there were no other real native writers around when I was growing up. So I decided to go and seek knowledge from people I thought knew more than me. So the first person I went to was my, was, um, my grade 11 English teacher. I walked into, his, into the homeroom class and I said to him, Sir, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And without even looking up from his desk, I remember this very distinctly. He was looking for something in the bottom left-hand drawer of his desk. Without even looking up, he said, no, not really. And that stayed with me. My, you know, I, 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 I trusted on him for his opinion, and he said, no, not really. Now, I'm also a firm believer that living a good life is the best revenge. So that as the decades went by and I became a writer and I ended up traveling around the world and I ended up talking to people, young people like you, I always want, want to tell you, if there's one thing I want you to remember, the only thing I can share with you, the only thing worth remembering from anything I have to say today is never trust your grade 11 English teacher. <laughs> the second person I went to was my mother. I went to talk to my mother, and I told my mother I wanted to be a writer, and my mother looked at me with a very odd expression. She said, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. And I can understand where this was coming from. Uh, my mother um, had grown up on the reserve. Her first language was Anishinaabe. She had a grade six education, and had that philosophy of, unless you are working class, you had no class. Um, writing was just not something on her radar. And she'd actually told me when, uh, when I was young that she spent most of her life, up, um, most of it, cooking and cleaning for white people. And she said she'd never had a single job she'd ever enjoyed. And that, again, that stayed with me. But more than anything else, it was that phrase, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. And that bounced around my head again. The decades went by. Always remembering those words, 
I ended up sending my mother postcards from places like um, India, China, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Mexico, Cuba, the Bahamas, England, uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, Holland, Denmark, Germany, the Czech Republic, Austria, France, Germany, um, uh, Spain, and Italy. All, and I sent my mother a postcard saying, this is where writing got me. But also, being a very good and respectful son, I would bring my mother back souvenirs from all over the world. So my mother had the best plate collection of anybody on our reserve. So anyways, I had wanted to be a writer, but nobody wanted me to be a writer. I had no encouragement. So these people were much wiser than me, and I decided not to be a writer. However, um, I was entering my late teens, and on the reserve, I did what is often referred to as the reserve math, the res math. I told you how big my family was, and the community where I was growing in, the reserve, was about 900 people. Uh, you know, combine that with my big family, it became very, very apparent to me that I was related to practically every girl on the reserve. And that was problematic. So I decided to go to college and move to a city of five million people, half of them women, none I was related to. <laughs> and I liked that, those odds and that math. So I ended up going uh, to college to uh, for radio and television broadcasting, which was technically the worst thing I could take because growing up, as, as, this is the same with a lot of native youth, I was very, very shy. I grew up being very, very shy. And the idea of taking a, a, a profession where f walking up to people and phoning people I did not know and asking them questions that were frankly none of my business was like the worst career I could take. But uh, I ended up doing that and uh, not being very good at it. So I ended up kicking around Toronto for, for a number of years. I wanted to be a writer, but I was told not to be a writer, but I was always interested in the arts. The arts I found very interesting. So I ended up getting various jobs that were, there were jobs, but not a career. And I ended up uh, working for a uh, Canadian Native Arts Foundation. I worked for CBC Radio as a trainee producer. I did the location sound on some documentaries on Native culture. And then I got this opportunity to work for a film company. And this is where things get interesting. This is a film company that was doing a television series about taking place on a fictional native community in northwestern Ontario. And um, all the writers were non-native, the directors were non-native, the producers were non-native, and a third of the actors were non-native. I had managed to get a grant from the government for 50% of a salary. I showed up, said I have a grant, they hired me, and I was the only native person working in this office that was doing a television series about native people. And, um, but it was all what was re referred to as grunt work. Um, I was a, a production assistant, casting assistant, chaperone for the kids, all these different things. Just, you know, whatever, whatever needed to be done. But one of the things I got the opportunity to do was they would give me the scripts to read that the non-native writers had written about native people. And of course, I, I don't know if you guys will understand this, but it took place in northwestern Ontario, up near the Manitoba border. I'm from three hours north uh, east of here, and their assumption was we're identical people, separated by 1,500 miles. What the hell? So they gave me the scripts to read for technical accuracy. So I would read these scripts, and they, uh, because I was a native youth, while well, I was in my 20s, but they'd give me these scripts to read, and I would read them, and they'd say, so is it technically accurate? And I'd say, yes, native people eat toast. <laughs> so I would read these scripts and tell them that, and um, they would shoot them. And I got to, uh, what was really more interesting is because I read these scripts over and over and I deconstructed them, I learned what a half hour script was and how it's structured, what made it work. A couple, little, sometime later, I got this opportunity to write this half hour drama of this other television series and having never written a script before, I did, and it ended up being shot. And the doors opened for me. Now, most of us believe here in Canada, I'm primarily known as a playwright. Most of us believe the contemporary native theatrical and literary renaissance began in 1986. 
November 22nd, 8 p.m. The wind was out of the east. And the Maple Leafs were playing badly. Um, that's when a play called The Red Sisters premiered in downtown Toronto and revolutionized the larger Canadian and native literary community. It blew the doors off what was known as Canadian theater at that time, and it showed that native people had stories to tell in their own way, their own unique style, and that they were interesting and that non-native people would find them relevant. And that is where things got interesting for me as a writer because I'd written a, couple, I'd written a television show, a half-hour television show, you know, big deal. Um, but native theater was blowing up. It was, it was expanding exponentially. I call it the Big Red Bang. And a man named Thompson Highway, who'd written the script, was also the writer in, was also the artistic director of the Canada's premier native theater company. And he had gotten this grant for another thing called the Writer in Residency Program, which meant he had to hire an up and coming native writer to work with the theater company. And at that time, there were two working native playwrights in Canada himself and a man named Daniel David Moses, who was the outgoing writer in residence. So he had a bit of a problem. He was getting desperate because if you don't spend the grant, you have to give it back, and that goes against the nature of many artists. Not only that, they might take it away from next year's budget. So he was desperate, and he did what a lot of desperate people have done. He went to the bottom of the barrel, and there I was, passed out. And he asked me if I wanted to be the writer in residence for Native Earth, and I said no. The education I had growing up on my reserve and later when we were bused to a nearby community for high school had taught me that at that time Canadian theatre was, uh, was about dead white men. And I didn't know any dead white men. I didn't speak iambic pentameter, so I said no. But Thompson sort of played dirty. He knew I had a hungry landlord that liked to be fed on a regular basis and that I was lurching from job to job, and he said, Drew, look at it this way. It's uh, 20 weeks work, sit through the rehearsal of two plays, maybe write a play at the end of it, and it's a big chunk of money every week for 20 weeks. And I said, when do I start? So I'm one of the few people you'll meet that got into theater for the money. So that was my glorious introduction to theater, keeping in mind I'd never taken a theater course in my life. I'd never taken a television writing course in my life. I just sort of woke up one morning and was a playwright. Um, but what I learned and what I find really interesting at that time was if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. So I started to research. I started to read all these native plays and books I could find, go to as many native plays as I could. I wanted to know what was happening in this genre. And this, for me, this is where, where my eyes were opened. Um, almost all the plays from the late 80s to the mid 90s that were coming out of the native community, same with novels, short stories, poetry, etc., were all dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. Um, all the characters that were being created were either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. And this sort of made sense because if you, um, because I, I've had conversations with Aborigine playwrights in Australia. Maori playwrights in New Zealand, and to a lesser extent, Dalit writers in India. And when we were talking about this, they would say that when you're at the bottom of the social hierarchy, whether it's for hundreds of years or thousands of years, and you're given a chance to tell your story, chances are it's not going to be a comedy. So within the Native community, all these stories were coming out of Native people who, and it was basically the result of 500 years of colonization. I refer to it as like a, um, a, a hangover from colonization. And so uh, in the beginning of an essay that Thompson Highway has in The Red Sisters, he talks about this phrase, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And that's what was happening during those early years of Native literature. All these Native writers were, were writing about the repercussions, the after effects of colonization. And um, so uh, basically it was a cathartic thing. You know, these Native people were saying, you know, we've got our voice back and we're a little annoyed and this is why. So this was all coming out. And so um, all these stories that were dealing with the dysfunctional aspect 
of the Native community were being written, all dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. And I, as I said, I understood this. It made sense. It's part of the healing process. But I've been very fortunate to have traveled to over 140 Native communities across Canada and the United States. And everywhere I've been, all the Native communities, I've been greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. Um, Native people have a wonderfully developed Native sense of humor. And I remember talking with an elder from the Blood Reserve in Alberta who told me when I was talking about this, he said in his opinion for Native people, and I don't know if people, if how many people here will understand this, but he said that he thought for Native people, humor was the WD-40 of healing. Now, WD-40 is a type of motor oil you use in car engines and things like that to help the engine run smoothly, not damage itself, and go on. So basically saying humor helps promote and encourage healing. So you've got Thompson Highway saying, um, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And then you've got this, this other saying, you know, um, uh, Humor is the WD-40 of healing, they go back to back. And I love that phrase so much. Humor is the WD-40 of healing. I like it so much, I always thought it was t-shirt worthy. So, I thought, let, I, nobody else, nobody is exploring the Aboriginal sense of humor. Um, it's all dealing with the dysfunctional aspect. And I wanted to, so much to do that because I, I would look at my mother at home on the reserve. My mother had a fabulous sense of humor, but I wasn't seeing that on the stage. My mother was not oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. And I, I remember talking with two um, uh, Native women coming out of two different plays in two different cities. I asked them, did you, what did you think of the play? And they both said, I don't think I'm going to go see any more Native plays. I'm tired of being depressed. And the other interesting aspect of Native theater at that time, too, it moves in cyclical phases. Native theater dealt a lot with the trickster right off the bat. The trickster is a character in many, from many Native cultures that um, helped teach humanity its flaws and problems through being silly, through having difficulties through having tricks played on itself. It was a sort of a wonderful, interesting character. And as a result of the success of Red Sisters and Dry Lips, a lot of Native writers were using the trickster in a lot of their work. The other interesting character, uh, characteristic that popped up in Native literature was, and I'm sorry to say this, the concept of rape. Almost every play and every novel that came out of the Native community, there was sexual violence in it. And when you think about it, the largely patriarchal church and government from Europe that came to Canada and any colonial com country and sort of imposed its will upon the indigenous people. The best metaphor for what happened to Native people was rape in either literary or actual form. And um, I remember talking with the, this Native actress who had finished one play Native play and was working on another Native play. We were having lunch. She seemed kind of down depressed. I said, what's wrong? And she said, oh, it's these Native plays. It's very tiring being raped eight times a week, twice on Wednesdays for the matinee. So um, as I said, this was becoming the major themes of Native literature. And I wanted to be more positive. I wanted to precipitate in that healing. So I decided I wanted to explore the world of Aboriginal humor. And I did that through a number of different ways. Um, I ended up writing humorous articles and essays. I ended up writing humorous plays. I write four types of plays. Dramas, which are self-evident, but have a lot of um, humor and comedy in them because that is the nature of the Aboriginal experience. I write theater for young audiences. I write what I refer to as intellectual satires. And I write comedies. Just, as I like to say, comedies that are sheer celebrations of the Aboriginal sense of humor with absolutely no socially redeeming qualities whatsoever. But that may be inaccurate. My very first comedy was called The Bootlegger Blues. And it dealt with a 58-year-old good Christian Ojibwe woman who through a series of circumstances finds herself in possession of 143 cases of beer that she has to bootleg to buy an organ for the church. And it's based on a true story. And then, so based on that and, and writing a whole bunch of other plays, um, I decided, I was, I was given the opportunity to write and direct a documentary for the National Film Board of Canada, documentary on Native humor. 
And I spent a year working with, my, with, with other people in the native humor department. And I did a documentary called Redskins, Tricksters, and Puppy Stew. And based on that, I decided, you know, okay, I've done a 54-minute documentary on native humor. Is that all there is about native humor? And I thought, no, of course not. Because what you have to keep in mind is a time of contact here in Canada in 1497, there are over 50 separate languages and dialects spoken in Canada. That, uh, that's like discovering, um, you know, each language and dialect represent a completely different people. That's like discovering Europe. So there's no one European language, there's no one European sense of humor. There's so many different indigenous people in Canada and I did a 54 minute documentary, it wasn't enough, so I decided to do a book that explored and deconstructed native humor. It was called Me Funny. It was a series of essays on various aspects of native humor, but more interestingly, I spent a year collecting what are referred to as Indian jokes from all over North America that best illustrate the sense of humor. Now, in the larger context of, of cultural humor, what I like to say is what makes us laugh makes you laugh, and what makes you laugh will make native people laugh. We all have an indigenous, we all have a funny bone, and there's no particularly native way to boil an egg or tell a joke. So, but keeping in mind, keeping that in mind, cultural humor is very, very unique, and I don't have to tell people here that. Um, for, uh, for instance, um, it's like cooking with chicken. Picture humor as being a big chicken, and we're cooking chicken. Everybody likes chicken, but it's this particular cultural spice you use to cook that chicken that gives it its cultural uniqueness, whether it's tandoori chicken, chicken cacciatore, or a mixed chicken. So in terms of humor, we all pretty much laugh at the same things, but there are certain characteristics that give, give each, each culture its own unique uh, switch on humor. Same with native people. Um, the, there are two more dominant characteristics in the world of native humor, and I'll give you examples. One, our humor is very self-deprecatory. We love to make fun of ourselves as an individual, as a nation, or all nations. Normally, humor works from the bottom up. We like to make fun of people that are on a higher social function than us. You, within a native community, it's usually white people, whereas racism works from the top down, use works from the dominant culture downwards. Um, the other interesting characteristic of native humor is related to the first one is the concept of teasing. You've heard me say I've been to 140 native communities across Canada and the United States. I've been teased in 140 native communities across Canada and the United States, and often that teasing is a sign of acceptance because it's impolite to tease a stranger, at least to his face. There's even an anthropological term for that kind of teasing. It's called permitted disrespect. Now, an example of the... Um, wrap, oh, I'm, wrap it up. Okay, five, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes? Okay, all right. Um, give you an example of um, the uh, humor being, um, uh, we'd like to make fun of each other. Here's an example by a native comedian. Uh, definition of a native family. Woman goes to the window, looks out, and yells to her husband, Honey, my kid and your kid are beating up on our kid. <laughs> mm. Now, one of the interesting things I found in taking apart native humor is there are jokes that are specifically native, created by native, for native people, and there are jokes where you can insert your own ethnic background in that joke. And I'll give you an example of an Indian joke, a native joke for native people. Why do native people hate snow? Because it's white and all over our land. And here's a joke of insert own ethnic background here. That starts off as a native joke. What do you call a native person with a PhD? A doctor, you stupid idiot. <laughs> um, now, now, I'm going to tell you my, my, my one favorite joke I've been told all over the world, and I'll end up with that. Now, we're doing question and answer? Yes, okay. I have. Been, I was told this joke by a native woman in Nanaimo, and it's so. Um, I just about fell out of the car, and I've told this joke all over the world and gotten a great response, um, all except for one place. 
uh, and uh, I think it'll probably be self-evident. All right, here's my here's the joke. This these two native women are getting to know each other and having tea and chatting, and one woman is absolutely shocked and surprised to discover that the other woman has. 10 children that she's all named Lloyd. And the other woman can't understand this. She says, why did you name all your kids Lloyd? Don't you find that confusing? And the mother goes, oh no, not at all. In fact, if anything, it's a great time saver. Uh, first thing in the morning, all you have to do is yell, Lloyd, time to get ready. Lloyd, time for school. Lloyd, time, time to have breakfast. They'll hear and they'll know what they have to do. But the other woman isn't convinced. She says, but what do you do if you have to talk to just one of your kids, like the second younger or the oldest? What do you do then? And the mother goes, oh, well, if I have to talk to just one of my kids specifically, I call them by their last name. <laughs> Now, as I said, I've told that all one place and gotten a really great response, all except for one country. I was, um, I was up there, I told the joke, I did the final line, you know, I called them by their last name. Absolute silence. There was like, off in the distance, your coyotes howling, tumbleweeds went across the stage. Nothing. And I was in China. Right? And it had nothing to do with language because I was doing a lecture tour of universities and in universities I guess you have to be able to speak uh, another language to get in. But I was, uh, I, nobody got the joke and I had to ask my, my wrangler, my, my um, um, translator when I needed one, my assistant, why doesn't that work? And she said, three, well, three reasons and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> have to either talk to somebody from China or figure it out yourself. It's actually quite... It was quite interesting. I've had, it's one of the only cases I've ever, places I've ever been where the joke, there was a, a cultural difference between native humor and another culture. And I found that absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.